Listen to me, Angolo. I'm gonna put this as simply as possible. Either you change your agent, or he's a man. Spring 2017, Haute de Seine, just outside of Paris. Angolo Kante is enjoying dinner in a local restaurant. A man hastily invites him outside. One of the nicest people on the planet, Kante obliges, probably thinking that this is once again a fan who wants to take a few selfies. A few seconds later, Chelsea's superstar midfielder is held at gunpoint in a car with dark tinted windows. As he's feeling the cold touch of the pistol on his knee, he tries to keep it cool. The chilling conversation comes to a close and Kante walks away unscathed, at least on the surface. Who are the men involved in the horrific incident? What were their motives? Why did they ask Kante to change his agent? How did Kante respond to the threat down the road? This is not the end of the hard to believe story that involves money, vulture-like men, and an incredibly humble human being. If anything, it's only the beginning. Welcome back to Football Files. Today, we're talking about how a terrible entourage nearly cost N'Golo Kante his career. Act one, a superstar yes man. Before 2015, the number of football fans who knew N'Golo Kante was limited. Back then, the small-framed box-to-box -box midfielder was in Ligue 1, playing for Caen. Kante's deceivingly enormous strength and unlimited energy made him a top choice for teams who were on the hunt for a ball-winning defensive midfielder, just like Leicester City, who were looking for a player to replace Esteban Cambiaso. Discovering Kante was the work of the renowned scout Steve Walsh, who was also responsible for the transfers of Jamie Vardy and Riyad Mahrez to Leicester City. Before anyone else meddled with their affairs, the Foxes pulled the trigger on Kante for around $10 million and sealed the Frenchman's move to the United Kingdom. Both Kante and his old acquaintance and new agent, Abdelkarim Dewey, were happy. Where so many players failed, especially in his position due to the Premier League's extremely demanding level of physicality, Kante was to shine almost immediately. As if he was designed in a lab by some mad scientist, he was working like a machine, making tackles and interceptions like it's nobody's business with a never before seen consistency. He was still all smiles and as humble as ever while doing so, and that made him even more respected both among peers and fans. He was the nicest player the game has ever seen, for sure, and quite possibly one of the nicest people, period. As Kante and his teammates went on to make history by winning the Premier League for Leicester City, which was arguably the greatest football achievement of the Premier League era, the humble and all-smiling little guy was now a superstar. Despite joining the Foxes with a four-year-long contract, what he showed throughout the season made him a target of so many giants of the game. Among many who tried, it was Chelsea who secured his services for over $40 million. A year into their professional relationship, Kante and his agent Dewey had managed to get two big deals in a row. But as happy as they were, other people were getting angry. In his rather fresh career, Kante had already more than 10 different people representing him on different occasions. So his relationship with agents was never all that stable. As nice as he has ever been, Kante was not able to turn down people from his entourage who wanted to represent him. While his prior career didn't cause any stir among the many representatives, his last two big money moves set the scene for a possible disaster. Act two, old friends, new enemies. Kante was playing for the Blues now, and he was as effective as he was for the Foxes at that. Following his entry to the Premier League's best 11 the year prior, he was looking destined to do the same with his new club. Antonio Conte was taking full advantage of this tireless dynamo, playing him regardless of the competition whenever he was fit to play. On a rare off day, Conte wanted to make the most out of his time and got back to Haute de Seine. He was going to see some old friends, enjoy a meal and get back to training with Chelsea. He did most of that but there was a little dark twist. Kante was kindly asked to leave the restaurant he was eating at. He wasn't suspicious, so he tagged along. But the man who was gentle enough during the brief moment he was in the restaurant was nowhere to be found, as he forced Kante into a car that was waiting just outside the restaurant. Once inside the car, Kante looked terror in the eye. Before he could speak, a gun was placed on his knee. The man holding the gun was Hauri Sadna a familiar face in none other than the brother of one of Kante's old agents, Rashid Sadna. 
Haori was sent by his brother to make Kante an offer he can't refuse. The reason behind the blood-curdling threat was simple. It was all about money. Rashid Sadna, just like another ex-agent and friend Idris Garu, was maddened since he missed out on the transfer commissions he could have made when Kante joined Chelsea from Leicester City. According to various reports, Abdelkarim Dui had made more than $10 million in commission fees thanks to the move. A mouth-watering sum for all of the vultures around Kante. A couple of years later, Kante was denying an event like this ever took place. I'm a football professional. I do not live in a world of thugs. While he was doing so, Rashid Sadna, the very man who was behind the story itself, was talking to the media as well. And he was doing so with a cheeky, devilish grin. My brother had a weapon, maybe, but he didn't point the gun at Kante. My brother is clever. He would not exert violence on a small one. He just gave him a choice. Sadna's description of the event was sinister all right, but there was some level of truth to it. Kante was really given a choice, a choice between fear and faith. He could succumb to the threat and drop his agent, or he could choose to fight and follow his heart. Kante did what you would expect from a man who got to where he is by clawing his way up. As if that conversation never took place, Kante kept his relationship with Adel Karim Dui. Act 3 the next chapter. Despite having ups and downs, both in terms of his professional relationships and in terms of his injury history, N'Golo Kante is still one of the most respected players in Europe. Approaching the end of his Chelsea contract by the day, all eyes are on the Frenchman and his decision about his future. Looking at how he has been hunted for his fame and money throughout the years, it's safe to say that some of the attention on him comes from some menacing people once again. Clubs that are currently associated with the Frenchman are PSG and FC Barcelona, and both are willing to go the extra mile for a summer transfer move. However, Kante is believed to be happy at Chelsea, and he's looking forward to extending his stay in London. Some argue that Kante will never get back to France for club football, as the turbulent relationship between him and his agents back home are in a state that could potentially cost him a lot more than just money. So PSG's chances of getting him look slim, to say the least. Regardless of where he ends up, as long as he is healthy, Kante will continue to mesmerize football fans, either with what he does on the pitch or with the heartwarming gestures off of it. Who knew that behind all the big smiles and discreet lifestyle, N'Golo Kante had such a dark story? Luckily, the Frenchman got off easy, but in true Football Files fashion, things could have been even worse. As we're wrapping up this episode, make sure to let us know what you think about Kante and his entourage. Do you think the Frenchman's kindness played a role in attracting so many agents? Where do you want to see him play in the coming season? If you missed our previous episode, don't fret. Check it out by clicking here. We'll see you in Football Files with another shocking story.